Hello there and welcome back to another review. So today we're going to be having a look at Godzilla vs Gigan, made all the way back in 1972 and directed by Jun Fukuda. Um, I believe this was the last film that Haru Nakajima, who usually played Godzilla, I think it was the last film he did. As I think he retired sort of like from uh, suit acting around this period. Um, Toho and the producers were not impressed uh, with the results and the, like the end product that was um, Godzilla vs. Hedera, which even though I think it was, a, as you you have seen my review, I think it's a really cool movie. I think it's one of the better ones. I think, as I mentioned that review, it's very underrated. It's often overlooked, and I think it's a brilliant Godzilla movie. But Toho, uh, you know, they were not entirely impressed by it, and I think with this film here, what they were largely trying to do is bring the franchise sort of back to its roots, bring it back to sort of that what made like a Godzilla uh, film like good back in the day, like what made a Godzilla film great. Bring it back to that sort of 60s golden era, so to speak. Hence why in this film we get King Ghidorah um, coming up as Godzilla's main foe. Um, unfortunately, um, like I've mentioned before, with these kind of films, there is a bit of a use of stock footage in this movie where a lot of... Um, you know, it's such a shame that they have to do this. I mean, the obvious thing, like I mentioned before, is just to cut down on costs, cut down on time, cut down on, you know, things like that. Um, but so there is a bit of stock footage in this one. Though one could look at Godzilla vs. Hedera as sort of like an experiment. A lot of the themes from that movie, um, surprisingly enough, do carry on uh, in terms of the topic of pollution. We also get the alien invasion theme here, which, as we know at this point, was nothing new. So they're sort of sticking to sort of what's been done before, but just trying to bring it back a little bit to like its core and what it was uh, then we have our new monster Gigan who is sort of like um how can I describe Gigan he's sort of like a cyborg uh Robocop sort of um I don't know if any of you remember the penguin it's like from Wallace and Gromit the wrong trousers uh sort of like that complete with a visor and a buzzsaw so that's sort of what Godzilla's up against and he's a very Gigan's a very formidable foe make no mistake um but a very very outrageous one um, I mean, the Japanese film industry was pretty much, uh, at this point, it was pretty much at a low ebb. It was pretty much at a low point uh, for the Japanese film industry, um, which, you know, filmmaking and things like that, films were happening, of course, but they weren't sort of real, you know, lavish um, sort of productions and the ideas for whatever just were not coming to fruition. Um so what with this film what they did was they only employed those that were necessary it was very much sort of you know there wasn't like excess amount of laborers and people on set it was basically let's just keep to the core people that we need and that's what we're going to use um, to make this film and the cast was largely unknowns um, and i believe the godzilla suit from destroy all monsters um, here is making its fourth appearance one thing I always did take from this movie is that this is a film um, that I always remember, this is where the monsters bleed, um, which we'd never really seen before uh, in a god. We've seen them get hurt, we've seen them fall down, but we'd never actually see them sort of bleed and get cut and things like that. Um, you know, there's always... Like in this film, there's scenes where Godzilla is attacked and that, like actual blood is drawn. Like You actually see him uh, do bleed. Along with stock footage from previous movies being used, we also get some of the same music cues being uh, reused as well. So not just sticking with actual film footage, even sticking with the like going using uh, like uh, some from the score and the musical cues and things like that. That gets used as well. As with our last movie, we had Godzilla jumping the shark and actually flying. Here you could argue they go because they go one step further probably with this movie um, and actually have him speak. Um, which they do it with via the aid of like speech bubbles when Godzilla speaks, and it's another one of them. What the hell am I watching? Moments, um, of course, for sheer originality. I will be reviewing um, the the Japanese version here, as I always do. I mean, I could do the dub version, but for the original, the originality, how the original film was, I always try and review films in their original language, how they were meant to be, how they were originally uh, done. Um, this is a Godzilla. This movie is very much in the traditional, um, you know, phases. I mean, wanting to try something new, but at the same time wanting to keep, like I mentioned, made, what made the original film successful. So, how good is Godzilla vs. Gigan? So, um, let's find out and get into it. You do have to love 
the way this film starts. It, I mean, with its opening right away, you have Godzilla giving his atomic breath right to the camera and the credits coming up like laser beams, which I think is pretty cool. Like, you get an atomic breath right at the camera as soon as the film starts. And it, it just, you know, I think it's quite an interesting way to open the movie. We meet, you know, this struggling manga artist, Gengo, and he is going for this job at this soon-to-be-open amusement park where they have Godzilla-like tower structure, right? So it's all about this amusement park. They've got, like, this Godzilla structure. He's a manga artist, and he's going there for a job. Um, he's always trying to plug his new designs in terms of the homework. Like the, He does, like, he's got one, like, the homework monster, and he's also got, um, I think it's the strip mum monster, some of his designs that he's done. The director of the theme park likes his ideas, so on his way to meeting with the director of like Children's Land, this girl runs out and bunts into him outside the office and drops like a tape. She's dropped like this tape, whatever. We don't know what it is. We don't know what's going on, but she's run out of the office. Once inside, he meets the chairman, who has like the, this awesome powerhouse of a swivel chair. If you watch this movie, I mean, his chair and desk is like he's pimped out. Um, the chairman is like um, drawing up all these plans for the orbit of like a space hunter nebula. Um, now he is meant to be the chairman of a theme park, right? <laughs> He's meant to be the chairman of a theme park. Uh, so why is he doing like space plans, right? You know that would make you go for a job, a you know local theme park, local business, whatever it is. But during the interview, he's like drawing up plans for outer space and nebulas and things like this so you know you'd think what is going on uh, so I'll, you know as the film goes on a very clever plot will be revealed um he says the girl he bumped into was an enemy like an enemy of the piece and the tapes she had dropped like she put has put a wrench in their plans so this girl that ran out she randomly finds it with with her hippie friend and she wants the tape back right Gengo faints and they take him to like home to his. I mean, I guess they were just able to get into his. I guess he had a key on him or something like that. So um, her brother, there's this girl, her brother Shima um, found out that the people behind Children Land are an enemy of peace and that her brother has gone missing and there are, there are these two mysterious tapes in circulation. They start playing the tape with which the chairman detects and Godzilla sorts of, like, hears it. I mean, this this is probably making no sense at all, <laughs> me going over the plot of this film, but just bear with me. So, yes, so they, they start playing the tape, which the chairman, like, he sort of detects it and Godzilla hears it. And then we have, like, these sort of thought bubbles with him speaking to Angiris, asking him to go and find out what's up. Like, they're just standing there and these speech bubbles come up and it's like... You know, we've had Godzilla fly, we've had Godzilla do all these other things, we've had Godzilla do a victory dance, let's have him, we've had Godzilla with a son as well, so in this film, let's have it so we can actually speak. So he tells Angiris to go and find out what's up, not sure why Angiris has to be like he's lackey, uh, but you know, anyway, they, t they just talk to each other. Uh, for some reason, Gengo and the two ears just met us, like scoffing down bananas like crazy. Like, if you watch this film and you watch this scene... Uh, the man grabs his gengo and like the two he's just met. Um, that because there's this scene where they're just all eating loads of bananas. Um, I have no idea what what is going on there at all, but they're just they're just gobbling them down. Um, like so, they're thinking of their plan. So after deciding they need more information, they are able to track down the chairman's house. After some sluicing, they find out that he died years ago, along with his teacher, who is the director. Um, whilst they were like, what they sort of think they died while they were climbing a mountain or something. That's what what is in what they say. Um, our park owners um, get a message from the space hunter and start broadcasting action tape one. Don't worry about these tapes too much. There's they're a sort of just a plot device. They're not really relevant, really, but um, they are just like a beacon or a signal. That's all they are, these tapes. Angiris arrives on shore, and the military start lavering him with bullets and heavy fire, which actually causes him to retreat. Gengo finds the girl's brother locked up in Godzilla Tower in the park, so we've got a bit of kidnapping going on. Um, and the director confronts them all at his home after planting tracking devices in some cigarettes that he's given them. Then Gengo's girlfriend, who's like a karate expert, comes in and saves them, and they all decide to go to the police. So the film has that Monster Island theme going on a little bit as well. Um, you know, you, you know, like where Godzilla and Anguirus are. The whole Monster Island thing, and they're still sort of playing into that, sort of with the films that have come before. 
And so basically, Godzilla, like, Anguirus went over to come to a shore. He got lavered in bullets. He retreats. And now Godzilla and Anguirus are coming over to see what all the fuss is about. Like, what's going on? What I like about another thing with this film, when I'm talking about things they do well, things that are different, things they added to the franchise, what they do well with this film is they do add something, in that, like I mentioned, Godzilla Blues. Here, you actually have Godzilla swimming. Yeah, he's not like, you know, like sometimes in the movies, he's walking in like the middle of the sea i don't care how godzilla big how big he's meant to be um but he's his feet can always touch the bottom right but here you can actually you know he does actually have to swim which i thought was a nice little touch um so after going to free her brother gengo and his girlfriend get caught and i have to love how he makes her do some karate on some guards first though like he's he's not the fighter in that like the relationship like she's uh like i said a karate expert so then we get the like the plot reveal. We learn that there are loads of planets like Earth, and that Space Hunter Nebula, Nebula is where they are from. And is full up of pollution, and they say Earth is going the same way. The big reveal here is that they are cockroach type aliens, right? They're they're sort of cockroaches, um, in human form rather than just aliens that sort of resemble like humans. I mean. One, if Earth is going the same way with pollution, why do you want it, right? So they've like. They've had the planet's been like full of pollution, right? So that if the Earth is going the same way with pollution, why do you want it? And two, if your plan is just to take over them, the take over the Earth, what the hell do you need a theme park for? Why do you need like an amusement park? What is that adding to your plan? Like, what is that in aid of? Where did you get the money and the plan information, like permission to even like come up with this theme park? It must have taken so much time and resources and money that. What has that got to do with your plan of sort of taking over the Earth? Um, so at this point in the movie, Gid Ghidorah and Gigan are on their way from space and they're being controlled by the tapes. Um, so it's sort of what we had before in terms of aliens wanting to take over, um, the, like the monsters being controlled by something somehow, uh, using control devices to control the monsters, yada, yada, yada. You get the idea. We've seen it before. Um, I mean, when I say they try to bring it back, I mean... <clears throat> I think if any, trying to bring it back is probably a bit generous. I think what they try and do here is sort of dial it down a bit, but at the same time, it's just as like as eccentric and mad as any film that's been done recently up to this point in the franchise. I mean, we've got cockroach aliens and God knows what else. So, yeah. So they're on their way from space to like see what's going on. Being controlled as these tapes sort of had their plans encoded on it or something like that. I mean, no idea how, but, you know, who cares? So on arrival, they both start causing loads of destruction. This is when you notice a lot, and I mean a lot, of reused footage. There's a lot of reused footage here, especially in terms of some of the miniatures and military shots. All the while this is going on, Godzilla and Anguirus are still swimming. They're still carrying on in the ocean with Godzilla in speech bubbles saying, come on, move faster. Like <laughs> we, have, we have these speech bubbles like with Godzilla just like, you know, really spurring on uh, Anguirus. Um, the Air Force come in and Gigan is just clawing them down and him and Ghidorah are just laying waste to everything around them in spectacular fashion. There's some nice little shots in here. Um, then Godzilla and Anguirra is finally sharp and we have quite, I would say, quite a lengthy um, fight sequence. It's quite a lengthy one uh, with them basically blowing the crap out of the set here. Um, <clears throat> I always felt with this movie like they don't even care like a battle is raging with these great massive monsters. They're more concerned with this rest, like the characters are more concerned with this like rescue operation in Godzilla Tower. They don't seem to be that worried that a big monster fight is happening. Um, they managed to escape via the aid of like a balloon and a zip line. Um, and you know this fight is serious as Gigan actually makes Godzilla bleed, which I say I think is the first time, to my knowledge, at this to up to this point in the franchise that we'd seen that. I don't recall in previous movies we'd seen any of the monsters bleed. I could be wrong, but I do believe this is the first time they actually bleed. Um, he's also overpowering him with like his flying kick. Godzilla is like in his dazed and confused state goes to attack Godzilla Tower, um, which of course shoots laser beams at, at him as well. Um, 
I mean, you know, I mean, I would have been shocked if it didn't shoot laser beams, right? I mean, it's a great big tower in the theme park. He's got to shoot laser beams. Of course he has. And I mean, this r laser really does mess him up. Like, this laser properly, properly messes him up. So our ragtag team of heroes managed to get some TNT from somewhere. They get some TNT. Don't ask me where, as I don't think it's ever explained. And they plant it in the tower's elevator. There's, and this is enough. What There only seems to be this small group of people. Like, it, you don't really see many shots of other people or, like, ordinary bystanders or anything like that. But they've managed to get, like, their hands on some TNT. So they put it in the, like, the elevator, so when it reaches the top, it blows up and kills the aliens and whatever. So speaking of Gigan, this is, like I say, one sadistic monster. Um, one minute, he's clawing away at Godzilla's face, not to mention he has a buzzsaw in his body and he's made Godzilla bleed. Godzilla gets on his feet and makes a great comeback. The one thing I will say, what you do get in this movie, like I mentioned, is a lengthy fight. You do get a lengthy battle at the end with this one. As I mentioned, though, they do, unfortunately, however, reuse some shots of Anguirus fighting Ghidorah. They also make Anguirus do, like, this back attack a few times where he uses, like, his shell and keeps launching himself backwards. Uh, I mean, okay, you know, if it works, go for it. Um, this was something that would be quite common with Godzilla movies, like the idea of a team-up. Um, what you hear at like two monsters versus one or two v two rather than the standard one v one monster battle sometimes it was two v one or two v two i think it makes it a lot more interesting to i think from toho's perspective the more monsters you got on the screen the better um godzilla does three or four ultimate power slams on Ghidorah. so after they've had enough Ghidorah and guy can just leave then this is what always happens there's never a finishing blow or a finishing like Ghidorah, whenever he's had enough he just he just flies off that's all that of like like Ghidorah ever does and it's like no like I say there's it's like there's nobody else there in this movie there's no police hel helicopters there's no news teams there's no police in general there's not really many people despite the fact there's these giant monsters fighting there's not it's just this small group of people who like sort of wave at Godzilla as he leave um yes the premise is silly um but I think to, well you could argue probably all Godzilla films are silly, maybe not the first one aside, um, but, you know, this film is definitely in the silly ca category. Um, you aren't here for a super clever, intricate plot. You want to see monsters beating the crap out of each other, and the, and the team on this movie deliver that. Um, like I say, in a fantastic, lengthy fight sequence of, like, a, it's a 2v2 battle, and it's worth watching this one uh, just for the ending alone, because you do get a lot, like I say, some some of the fights, sometimes they're cut, either cut short, or it, they, the way they do it and the moves they do, it's not that interesting. But here, it's quite good. You do get a bit of a bang for your buck with the end fight. Um... I will as I say I've got quite a few to go through. Um, I will one day do maybe a video. I keep saying about ones that I like, ones that I don't like, ones that are good, not as good. Um, I will one day maybe do a video where I do rank them in order. But as I've mentioned before, me ranking stuff is never easy for me to do because I do the list and I'm happy with it, and then I look at it a day later and I like think no 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 number four should be number two and it'll be forever changing but i might be able to give you like uh, maybe a roundabout list of like the just if just looking at the, like the shower era of godzilla movies i might be able to put them in some sort of order in terms of like my favorite like to like complete worse so um a few more godzilla movies to go and i hope you're enjoying the reviews and thanks for checking in with this video and i'll see you again soon Bye concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory.